We started a new series last week, if you were not here, which many of you were not. So I'll review a little bit more intensely today than I normally do. We started a new series on honor. And uh, my whole goal behind this series is to bring honor back into our church, bring honor back into our families, bring honor back into the relationships that we have. How many believe that it'd be good to see honor come back? How many remember the day, I mean, some of you are older, so you all remember the day, right, when people would say, yes, sir? Kids would say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Remember those days? And people say, man, that's just Southern. You know, that's the way the Southerns talk. That's just Christian. Yeah. I mean, to treat people with honor. And wouldn't it be awesome if your kids said, yes, ma'am. And, and they were playing with their video game and you walked in the room and said, hey, man, I need you to take out the garbage. They were like, stopped everything and said, yes, ma'am. And got up and did it instead of saying, I'll do that in about a half an hour when I'm done with this game. Wouldn't that be awesome? And wouldn't it be awesome if parents started to treat their kids with honor? Wasn't a great amen on that one. All the parents love that about the kids, but they're not a great amen. But I believe that God wants us to treat everyone in honor. Honor goes all the way around. It doesn't just go, I want honor, but you know, I'm not gonna honor you. Honor goes all the way around in every direction in our lives. So last week we talked about this in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus, the Bible says, came into his hometown and he's there preaching. And all these people from his hometown said, isn't this a carpenter's son? Isn't this the guy we knew? He, he, he grew up as a carpenter. His dad's a carpenter. Who is he to tell us all this stuff? And the Bible says they got offended at him. And Jesus said only a prophet would not be without honor in his hometown, or in other words, where people made him common. They knew him. They brought him down to an ordinary life, and they knew him like that. And Jesus said only in that kind of place is a prophet without honor. And then it goes on and says this. It says Jesus could do no great miracle or mighty work in that place. And so here's the deal. How many miracles pass us up because we forgot about how important honor is? Honor stopped Jesus from doing some pretty great things. And so I don't want to stop him. I'm sure no one here today wants to stop Jesus from doing something in your life that you need done. We want to honor the way that God says that we're to honor. So honor, we found this out last week, there's, there's the opposite of honor, and it's called dishonor. And here's what happened with Jesus. They dishonored him. Two reasons why they dishonored. Familiarity, remember we talked about this last week. Uh, they became so familiar with him. The word familiarity, the, the root word is family. And how many know right here today, all of you that are family with someone, you show more dishonor in your family than anywhere else. It's just easier to say something nasty to your wife because you know her and she's going to take it, you know, so you show dishonor or, or the same with your husband or with your kids. So family shows dishonor more than anywhere else. And so, you know, if you're part of a church family, you're part of a serving team, you're part of a group, it's easy to begin to show dishonor when you become so familiar with those that are around you. But here's what we want to do. We want to start honoring. Jesus had dishonor and couldn't do anything. The other thing that caused dishonor was offense. And we said this last week, whatever you're offended at, you cannot honor. So if you're offended at your mom and dad, you can't really honor them. If you're, you know, if you're older and you say, man, I'm offended at my mom and dad, I'm older, but I can't stand them. Well, then you, you won't have honor. And so here's something important. I don't know if you wrote this down last week or not. I might have not said it exactly like this, but obedience is the act. I have to do this. How many know your kids have to do some things out of obedience? So they do it. They act it out. They do whatever you ask them to do. But honor is coming from the heart Honor is the attitude. I mean, you can do something and not want to do it, and you can do something because it's the joy of your life. You want to do it. You have the right attitude. That's honor. So when we honor in our schools, we honor our principal, we honor our teachers, we do that not because we have to or put a show on. We do it because we know that's what God's going to get praise from or glory from. In other words, when they look at you and you do that, people are going to say, man, that, that's, that person's really different. I've never seen a teenager like that before. They honor the principal. They, they honor the teachers. That's just amazing. And how about if, you know, I, I don't know if you all remember this from last week, but there's one scripture in the New Testament that gives kids a command. Kids are only commanded one commandment in the whole Bible, in the New Testament, and it pulls from the Old Testament. And Paul said, children, obey your parents and the Lord. And he says, honor your mom, your dad, you honor your parents. 
And he said, it's connected with a promise. And here's what I found out. When we honor, God promises us that he'll do something back if we honor. So he told the kids, he said, if you honor your mom and dad, he said, not only is it going to be well with you, life will be well with you. He said, but you have a promise of long life. So if I honor my mom and dad, you honor your mom and dad. Listen, honor is not deserved. Honor is decided. So I'm going to decide to honor because it's what God says to do. And when I decide to honor my mom, my dad, especially when you're a child, when you're young, listen what happens. When you honor, here's what happens. God promises you long life and life will be well with you. How many here could handle some long life and well? It's a well life. In other words, this is a bad life. I'm having a a long life and life is well with me. That's what God promises you. Now, here's the question. Why would God ever tell children? he He doesn't say this. He doesn't say to children, you have to love me. It's a commandment. He doesn't tell children, you have to praise me. It's a commandment. He tells children one thing, honor me. Honor or honor your parents. He doesn't say this. He doesn't say, honor God with all your heart. He says, honor your parents. Here's why. We talked about it a little bit last week. Honor transfers through the rest of your life at any age. So when you learn how to honor your parents, you'll honor your wife. When you learn how to honor your parents, because you're going to get older someday, you learn how to honor your parents. When you get that job, you'll honor your boss. It's really quiet in here today. So honor is transferable. In other words, when I start honoring at a young age, I'll honor the rest of my life. Now, if you're here and you say, man, I'm not a Christian or pastor. I've never learned about honor and I'm a Christian now, but I don't, I don't know about honor. Honor is teachable. It's learnable. You can learn honor because it's something that God asked us all to do. So he knew you were going to get older. He knew you might not accept Christ in your life till an older age. He, he knew all that. So now you can start honoring. And God promises you, if you do that, he's going to do something back at you. So he'll honor you. So I want to start off today with a quick story. Uh, back in 1924, the Olympics were in Paris, and I'm sure most of you uh, weren't watching them back then, but the Olympics were in Paris in 1924. They made a movie about it in 1981 called Chariots of Fire. How many here remember Chariots of Fire? You probably saw that. Well, it was based on two guys. One was a Christian guy, Eric Liddell. He was a Christian who was a Scottishman who was a runner. He was the fastest 100-meter man on the planet at that time. And so fast guy. The other guy that this story was based on was a guy by the name of Abrams. And he was a, um, he was a Jewish, devout Jewish guy. And he was running for the prejudice was against him. The whole movie's about, I'm going to run against prejudice. The Christian guy was running for the glory of God. This is what the whole movie was about. So they decided that the hundred meter race in the Olympics that year would be on Sunday. And he decided I'm not running. It's against what I believe to run on what he he felt was the Sabbath. So he said, I'm not running on that day. So man, it went all through the media. People couldn't believe it. So he decided it was enough in advance. He decided I'm gonna run the 400 meter instead of the 100. Well, I don't know if you know anything about running, racing, anything like that. But if you're trained in the 100 meter and decide before the Olympics start, I'm gonna go to the 400 meter, you're gonna probably get really whooped by all the guys that that's all they do is train for 400 meters. So he decided to do that started training a little bit before four, you know. And so they get right before the race starts, an American man comes up, another runner who's an American, comes up to this guy, Eric Liddell, and he hands him a piece of paper. And he takes that piece of paper, you know, and he, he looks at it and it says this, those who honor me, I will honor. He was telling him, because you honored God today in this race, God's gonna honor you. And so... The American coach tells all of his runners, you have nothing to worry about. Eric Liddell could have beat all of you in the 100 meter, but he won't beat one of you in the 400 meter. So the race gets ready to start. Remember, he gets handed this sheet that says, if you honor me, I'll I'll honor you. It's from a, a scripture in the Old Testament. He gets in that race and he wins the gold medal. It's really actually impossible for this guy to do that. There were guys that were the fastest on the planet at the 400 meter, and this guy should have never beat him. And he wins the the, the 400 uh, meter race because I believe he took it to heart and said, this is my conviction. I'm not going to run on this day, but 
When this man handed him that and said, those who honor God, he'll honor them. That man took a hold of that and said, I'm going to win, even though this is not the race I'm normally in. And so I want to talk to you about today. I entitled my message. You should have a little card they gave you on the way in on the front side. It has the title and it's simply called honor up. And all I want to do today is talk to you about honoring God. How do we honor God? We're going to talk about honoring up. It's just about honoring one person today honoring God. We're going to look at some scriptures about that. So if you have a Bible there, your iPad, iPhone, whatever you have, would you go with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel? And we're going to read a scripture to start off today, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I'll give you a little quick background about this. Eli is a priest in the Old Testament. And the priests were a called group of people. And if you remember last week, we entitled our message, Where is the Honor? We got it out of Malachi. The priests were not honoring God. Well, this is a similar story. Eli had sons. The sons of Eli were going to be priests. And they actually were operating in this priestly ministry that God put them in. But they were not honoring God. So God's speaking through Samuel to Eli, starting in verse 29. First Samuel 2, 29. He says, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I've commanded? in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me. Let's everyone stop. Everyone look up just for a moment. You can honor something more than you honor God. If you just remember the quick little definition, I'll give you more of it in a moment, but honor means you value. So you can honor something more or value something more than you value God. How many, how many would agree with me today? You know, people who honor their cars more than they honor God. Anyone know anyone like that? Now, you all know people that don't honor their cars, right? You get in their car. It doesn't look like it's been cleaned forever. And the back seat is McDonald's wrappers that are piled up and Burger King and Wendy's. And you're like, oh, my God, this car stinks. And they haven't done anything to it for years. But you have other people, you can't sit in their car. How many here have ever gone over, over to a house of an old Greek person or an old Italian person? Listen, and their furniture is all covered with plastic right? It's like you don't sit on it. Well, why did you get it? Well, you can sit on it, but it's going to have plastic on it so you don't ruin my furniture. So we can, let, we can have it for 90 years that way because it's never gotten dirty. It's never gotten anything on it. Well, that's what some people do with their cars. They honor their car more than they do God. These young guys, and Eli specifically here, the priest, he was honoring his children more than he would honor God. Now, only God could tell you what you might honor more than him. I'm not here tonight, today or last night to tell you, this is what you're doing. You're honoring this more than you're honoring God. Only God could tell you that in your heart. You might be here today while you're in church and, and God will deal with your heart and say, man, you're honoring this more than you're honoring. People honor their homes more than God. People honor all kinds of things more than they do God. And I believe this, I believe it's a quick little adjustment in the heart, because that's where God deals with. God's not looking at the outside, God's looking at the inside. I believe it's a quick adjustment in the heart to just say, you know what, I want to honor God more than anything else. So watch what happens. He said, you're honoring your kids more than you're honoring me. And he says, um, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, his, his children were still in the offerings. And he says, therefore, the Lord God of Israel, I, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would, uh, would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, for, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, that means to treat something common or to have no weight or no value, he said, they despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And lightly esteemed just means to treat something with no value, light, lightly, with lightness. And God said, listen, if you honor me, I'll honor you. So I want to ask you this question. Two, two things I really want to get to today. I want to talk about how, how do we honor God? How, how, is that even, how does that work? How do we honor God? And then I want to talk to you about some of the things God said he would do for you if you did honor him. See, God, God promises the children in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He said, if you honor me, everything's going to be well with you and you're going to live a long life. God makes promises to us, even in the New Testament, that if we honor him, he's going to honor us by blessing us. So, so God says, listen, man, I, if you honor me, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to honor you back. Well, it's nice that I could say, God, I honor you. And what's God going to say back? Well, I honor you. But that's really not actually how it works. Honor works this way. If I honor God in my actions, in my deeds, in my words, and how I treat people, because I can't treat people wrong and say that I'm honoring God. 
And this is how it all works, right? When, when there's a person who you're going to get nothing from, and, and, and maybe I'll put it better this way. Have you ever seen how people treat poor people? Gosh, it got quiet. But have you ever noticed how some people will treat someone who doesn't have any money and they know it? They won't give them the time. There's nothing you can get off of them. Well, see, that's not what we're in this whole world for as Christ followers. I'm not out to get something from you. I'm out to deposit something into you from my life because God's given me something that I could give you. So even if you're here and you're poor, you're saying, man, I'm a poor person. Good news is you don't have to stay that way. God can help you come out of that. But at the same time, everyone in this place should love you. Just like Christ said, we're to love people I'm not going to treat you different because you don't have a certain amount of money. So honor, when I honor God, I honor someone who might be poor. And when I honor someone who might be poor, then I'm honoring God and then God honors me. When I honor the things that God says to honor, then all of a sudden everything changes. So here's how I want to just break it down for you. The question would have to be this, that you have to ask yourself, do you value what God values. How many know God values certain things? So do you value what God values? There's an Old Testament scripture in the book of Psalms, Psalm 138, where it says this, God's talking. He says, I've exalted my word. I've exalted my word above my name. Did you get that? So I'm gonna just ask you this question. Do you think God values the Bible? Let me just tell you this. God's name is exalted above everything. If you ever read your Bible, read the Old Testament, the name of God, and he has met multiple names in the Old Testament, but the name of God is elevated above everything. In the New Testament, it says he gave Jesus a name that's above every name. Everyone knows that, right? Jesus has a name above every name, a name above cancer, a name above heart disease, right? Jesus has this name above everything. And God says in the book of Psalms, I took my word and I exalted it above my name. So we can say this, that one thing we can know for sure is that God's word is very valuable to him. God values his word. How many would agree? I mean, if you know Christ, you know this, right? God values his word. In fact, Christ, Jesus, and the word, the Bible says they're one. The Bible says in John 1, 1, 2, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. So the word and Jesus are one. You can't separate them. They're one. How much do you think God honors and values his word if he took it and lifted it up above his name? So here's the question. Is my Bible for me to read? Or is my Bible after church today for me to go out and throw it in the back seat of my car and never pick it up again until next Sunday? You guys aren't really helping me out today. Come on. Interactive. You got to say something. Even if you grunt, that's cool. Listen, this Bible, I know you might be thinking, well, man, I don't read mine that often. Now you're, now you're making me feel bad, Pastor. But we're talking about honor. We're talking about if I'm gonna honor God, one of the highest ways that I can honor God is take his word and start planting it into my heart and reading it on a daily basis and saying, man, I honor this word above everything. So, so with that in mind, I wanna show you a scripture. And uh, this is found over in Judges chapter 17. You don't have to go there. You can just watch it on the screen. Verse four through six, it says this. But Micah, it's reading Judges chapter 17. Micah gave the silver back to his mother. So she took about five pounds of silver and gave them to the silver, silversmith. And he used the silver to make a statue covered with silver. The statue was put in Micah's house. Micah had a temple for a worshiping idol. So if you know anything about the Old Testament, this would be not good. God doesn't want you to have idols, right? So we, we all know that. He made an ephod and some, uh, uh, and some house idols. Then Micah chose one of his sons to be his priest. And at that time, I just want you to hear this. The Israelites did not have a king, so everyone did what they thought was right. So we could put it this way. We could say it this way. In that day, because they didn't have any leader, they decided we'll just do what we think is right. We'll just do what we feel that it is right, right? So here's my deal. And I'm, right now, I'm not talking to you if you're here and you're visiting, you don't know Christ. You just listen to this. You can have some fun just listening. I'm talking to people who say they're Christians. This is what Christians have done in their life. I, don't, I, I just don't see it that way. 
So we start taking the Bible, God's word, and we start determining what we think it's saying when pretty much, I, I, I don't know, this is just me. I think the Bible's pretty easy to understand. If you're here and you say, well, I, I try to read that King James. I can't, thee and thou, just get another translation. It's okay. The Bible wasn't written in King James. It was written in Greek and Hebrew. And I know that's a fight in other churches, but it's not one here. So I would, I would, um, I would tell you this. Go find the easy-to-read translation or the God's Word translation. You can find them easily. Just look them up online, and they're the easiest thing to read. Puts it in terminology you can understand. If you want to break it down even easier and you want a little bit of hood in it with it, just get the Message Bible. I love reading the Message Bible because it puts a little bit of the hood in there and, I, and I'm like, that is awesome. So anyway, so the Bible, so, so I'm going to break it down. Remember what we're talking about? We're talking about honoring God. We're talking about honoring up. So how do I honor God? The highest thing in God's value system is his word. So in God's value system, besides people, his word is the highest valued thing. No one would argue the word's the highest valued, highest honored thing. So let's ask this question. You're in church, pastor's preaching, comes to a scripture and it says this, all of you, all of us, myself included, we're supposed to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. Your pastor gets up one day, he gives a vision and says, here's the vision of our church. We go to reach people far from God. And you're in church and you're hearing all this and man, the Bible says, go out. Jesus said, go into the highways and the byways, bring them in. But you're sitting in church and here's what you're thinking. Well, I've been a Christian for a long time. I don't know why they're emphasizing this part now. <sighs> I've been sitting in this church for years. They're going to tell me now I'm supposed to tell someone about Jesus? Are you crazy? Why are you changing all this, Pastor? We're supposed to just sit and you do everything. Why are you changing up on us? But see, the Bible says that our story, our life story, whatever God did in our lives is supposed to be shared with other people. We're supposed to share what Jesus did in our lives, how he, he, he brought us out of all the junk we were in and how he turned our lives around. Are we perfect? No. Have we reached some great level? No. But man, he turned our lives around. So my job now, I'm sitting in church and the pastor says, here's what the Bible says. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You ought to be preaching it to your dog. You ought to be preaching it to the rat that's in your basement, but you ought to be preaching it to every creature. But wait a minute, I was sitting in church and while the pastor was saying that, I got me a get out of witnessing card. I got me a get out of I don't have to share my story card. I got that because I'm a little more shy. He couldn't have been talking to me. I'm not gonna do that. I don't really have a story. Really? If you're going to heaven, you have a story. Or maybe you're sitting in church because that's not going over well, so let me switch it up. Maybe you're sitting in church and the pastor's up here preaching and he's saying this, right here from the Bible. I, I, I don't, we're not, no misinterpretation here. Right from the Bible, Ephesians chapter five, pastor says, everyone turn there. You all turn to Ephesians chapter five. Here's what the pastor says. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Puts his Bible down and says, Today we're going to talk about how husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Unselfishly, gave himself to the church. He didn't look at the church and say, Well, until you get better, I'll start loving you, but until then, I'm not. He loved them right where they were at. It's an unselfish love, it's a giving love. All you ladies, you got a friend up here and you're not even amening. <laughs> Hello. You're going to make me twist my neck. Come on. So, so here's what he says. <laughs> he says, husbands, love your wives. So all the husbands are sitting out there, right? Right now you're feeling like, oh God. But here's the deal. All the husbands are sitting out there saying, man, that's, yeah, amen. But then you know how many of us leave church, right? This is what all of us do. We have this temptation to leave church and say, man, that was good. I even took some notes because pastor said to take some notes. So I took some notes. I even wrote it down. I wrote some scriptures down. My God, my card's full probably get to heaven before anyone else because my card, I got all my cards at home from every Sunday. And here's the deal. We have this tendency to walk out of church and never apply what we heard. 
it's part of what Christians do. I, I don't know why we do it, but it's this part of, man, we just don't ever do what we were supposed to do. These guys, so we, sat, we sit in church and this is what happens. Everyone did what they thought was right. So this husband walks out and he says, I don't think that's really what it's saying. Well, what do you think it's saying? How are you interpreting? On your own scale? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, I don't think that's what that really means. Let's switch it up. That's not going well either. Come on. What if you're sitting in church, pastor gets up, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, not now, but I'm preaching this message and and it says, man, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all evangelists? And the answer is no, 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 we're not all, all those things. But in the verse above, he says, here's what God placed in the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, he put all those in the church and ministry of helps. In the Greek, it says those who serve, those who wait on people. And so the pastor gets up and says, hey man, everyone in the church should serve. How is it then that not everyone does that? Because we're sitting in church and while we're sitting there and the pastor's preaching that, if you're awake while he's doing it, you're sitting there thinking, here's the reasons why I don't have to do this. I'm a businessman. I don't have to serve. I'm I'm busy. You don't think everyone else who's serving is busy? It's called sacrificing your life. It's saying, hey man, I understand I'm busy, but the Lord said if I honor him by honoring his word, not sitting in a church service and having a million excuses why you don't do what it is that God said you're supposed to do. Here's what should happen today. There should be a run on out there in the, in the four years today. There should be a run on where do I sign up to serve? Because I want to honor God. I'm not saying, I'm not telling you to do this. The Bible tells you to do this. What if you're sitting in church? One more, I'm gonna go to scripture and we'll close. You're you're awesome. We're not closing yet, I got time. Anyway, I thought I was running late. Um, Anyway, listen to this. What if you're sitting in the church and the pastor, he goes to Proverbs chapter three and the Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. That's King James. In the Hebrew language, it says, honor the Lord with your money. Well, pastor, I'm not, I'm just, preachers, all they want is money. Well, no, no, I, I didn't say that. God did. God, God designed the local church. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Jesus is building the church, not Pastor Mike or not a man. Jesus is building the church. See, I don't like church. I don't like organized religion. That, that's just a cop out, man. This isn't organized religion. We don't believe in religion. We believe in Jesus. We believe Jesus is the only hope of the world. That's what we believe. So we don't believe in all that. So so you're in church and the pastor says, the Bible says, honor God with your money. What, What excuse have you decided? That in America, the average church in America, 9% of the people in a congregation support that congregation. 9%. In our church, we're at 30 some percent. As we've gotten bigger, the numbers come down. We're 30 some percent of the people that support the church. Where, where did the rest of the people, where did 70% of the people say, I don't have to. I don't have to honor God with my money. That's Old Testament. I'm living under grace. Have you not read the New Testament? Because Jesus said, give and it'll be given back to you. Always a promise. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He's saying, you give this amount, I'll press more back to you and get more back to you. That's what Jesus promised. Paul said this, he said, everyone ought to be a cheerful giver. But Paul said, man, when you come to church, when you're in, we're in a place like this, he said, everybody should give. What, what, what got into any of us? Why does the pastor have to come up and say, I gotta convince you, you must give. What? This is in the Bible. Honor the Lord with your substance. One last one, and I'm gonna go to scripture, I promise, one last one. Whatever happened, because this is for all you Christians, all of you that aren't Christians, just just laugh at everyone else. This is is for them, right? Where did it go that the people that do come to church, we know we're not perfect. We know that there are people sitting in this room that you could label yourself a sinner because you still sin, but you're not a sinner. You were saved by grace, so you're not really that, but you still sin. You still do things that are wrong. We're not saying anybody's perfect. But whatever happened to this, right? And I know this is like old time preaching. It's like, oh my gosh, he said that in church. 
But you know, the Bible says we're to honor God with our bodies. It's in the Bible. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, honor the Lord. He, he uses the word glorify. Glorify God with your body, which was your body was bought, your spirit, your body. They were bought with a price. He uses the word glorify. You can replace it with honor. He says, honor God with your body. You know how, how's a single person honor God with their body? They stay away from sexual relations outside of the marriage. Is it easy? No, man. When you're panting and making out and kissing that guy and you're like, oh my God, I love this guy. You can have me all. It's not easy to just say no. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if parents, and I know some of you younger parents that have, if you're like me when my daughter was young, man, just like your little daughters, I wanted to teach her, you're not going out with every guy and letting him have ever touch your body. Wouldn't it be cool if the parents would have taught their children at a young age, I'm not for everyone. I'm saving myself for the man that I love. And what if parents, what if parents would have taught their young boys, don't touch a girl. Not if you plan to marry, you only touch her unless you plan on marrying her. Not, I'm not talking about that. You don't touch her till you're married. I know it's old fashioned. Some, some of the old fashioned people are like, Jesus, my pastor's back, glory. All right, so how do I honor God? Listen, so I honor God. I honor God by when I hear the word, not my pastor. When I hear the word, I'm going to honor God. If I have to learn how to honor God with my body, then I'm going to learn how to do that. Please, Jordan, please, Josh, please anyone who's in the, in the younger ages where they're teaching you, teach us how to honor God with our bodies. We don't want to give them up. They will teach you. They've been teaching that. How do I honor God with that? I'm in church and now I've been taught honor. So now I'm in church and the pastor says, it's in the Bible. God says to honor us with, this, with our finances. What am I going to do? I'm going to honor him and do whatever he asked me to do. So let's go to one last, you all ready? We're going to go to a scripture and we won't be much longer. Go to James chapter one. You're going to love this. James chapter one. So how do we honor God? How do we honor up? We honor God by valuing what God values. God values his word above everything. So, you know, if you've been in our church for any length of time, we value God's word here. We believe God's word is the most important thing. Guys, what if I would get up every weekend and just read out a Reader's Digest? Would you enjoy that? Right? I mean, you're like, I'm not coming to church. I can read that at home. I want to hear what the Bible has to say. I want to hear how the Bible can pull me up and I could be a better person unto God and I could live for God and I could serve God and my family can serve God. And I want, I want that. I'm not coming to church to hear you read out of the USA today. I want to hear you tell me something that God can do for my life. Now, I might tell a story and the story might have come from there, but I'm talking about how, what can we do to pull you up? Well, that's only going to happen through the Bible. So here's what James says. James is the half-brother of Jesus. We'll, we'll pretty much close here. James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word. Now, all of you have been listening to the word today. Some of you have. Some of you have not been here. You're here. But I can tell. You're in Hawaii right now. Right? I mean, you're just out. You're not here. Verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word. Watch. And so deceive ourselves. So listen. The Bible says it's a, it's a deceptive thing. We don't want to hear that, but it is. It's deceptive to sit in church and just hear things. Did you hear that? Man, my mother-in-law needs to hear that. In other words, you didn't hear that for yourself. You heard it for your mother-in-law. She's out there, man. She needs to hear this. Man, I tell you what, I'm going to get this CD like right after church. I'm going right back there. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to give it to my cousin. He... <laughs> He's crazy. He'd be sleeping with everyone. So I'm going to give him this, tell him, you see what pastor said? <laughs> right? I mean, this is what we do. He said, don't just hear this. Watch this. Do what it says. I want you, everyone to say it out loud. See that part? Let's say it out loud. Do what it says. One more time. Do what it says. I think Christians, and I'm, I'm including myself, I'm not cutting you down. I think most Christians have a hard time with this. Do what it says. The Bible says we're to love one another. Do what it says. I'm not going to love that person. You see how they're dressed? They didn't dress like me. They're crazy. Their hair's all spiked and it's red. 
these kids today. Listen, you don't have to have red spiked hair and say, I'm gonna dishonor that person because of that. You can be a dishonorable person and look the part of a really classy individual. Watch what this says. He says, do what it says, verse 23. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says. Everyone say it out loud. But does not do what it says. One more time. But does not do what it says. What is he? He's like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it. We got to say it one more time. But doing it. So, so far, I mean, he's got this little phraseology in here three times. He says, you don't want to just forget what you heard, but I want to tell you this. In Joshua chapter one, it tells us this. If you keep on meditating on the word, you won't forget what it says. But he says here, you need to also put one more thing to it. You need to become a doer of it. You have to do what it says. He says, if you do what it says, you will be blessed in what you do. Don't get mad at someone else who's living a life that looks blessed and you might not be because that person could be do, doing something that you're not doing. It doesn't mean they're better than you. It doesn't mean that they're superior, anything like that. But maybe they're actually doing what the Bible says every day, not just at church. So I have one last scripture. You don't have to turn there. I'm just gonna read it. It'd be on the screens. I have one last scripture and we're closing. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus just is finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. Many, many of you that have been in church for a long time know that. Chapter 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5 and 6, he's truly only talking to his disciples. About halfway through chapter 6, they say the crowd caught up with him, and the crowd was sitting there listening to what Jesus was teaching on. So Jesus in chapter 7 is finishing up the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what he says. Matthew, Matthew chapter seven, verse 24 up on the screen. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them. Everyone say it out loud. Does them. One more time. All right, you weren't sure what to say. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. We all love that. We're just like, I'm gonna build my house on the rock. Watch this, the rain came, the water came, the wind blew. In other words, a big storm came, but the house did not fall because it was built on the rock. Just a side note, just because you're a Christian, just because you're a Christ follower, doesn't mean the storm's not gonna come. It's what you build your house on. It's what you build your life on. You know, someone told me the other day, they said, Pastor, you've had some storms lately. But I, I thought about that when they told me that. I thought, I might've had some storms, but I am not gonna let a storm take my life down or cause me to stumble or cause me to quit serving God. The storms are, they're designed in this world to try to take us out. But the storms, no matter what, we build our house on the rock. We're not going to be moved. But here, listen, we're almost done. Watch. Verse 26. Whoever hears these words of mine and does not do them, wouldn't that be sometimes the majority of some Christians around the world they hear it. It's like, like we got to get more. Give me more, pastor. I got to go deeper. I've got to hear more. I used to teach the Bible, you know, back years and years ago. When I first started, I was a youth pastor. I don't know if some of you know that. And the first youth service that I had, I opened up with Ephesians chapter 1 and got through three verses because I looked at every Greek word and told them the deep meanings of all these words. They all were staring at me just like you are right now. And um, no emotion, you know, they're, they're just staring at me. And when I was all done, the, uh, one of the other pastors on staff actually was in, he was watching this and he said, man, I never knew you knew all that stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, man, I, I know some stuff. <laughs> anyway, just kidding. Um, he said, I never knew you all that. He said, you know, none of them understood anything you were talking about. <laughs> I was like, why not? I made it really simple. And we have, we have adults here in our church. It's not deep enough, pastor. Listen, you can't do what we're talking about. Why would we want to give you something deeper that you can't even understand? I got to have something deeper, man. It's got to go so deep, pastor. It's got to be like, I'm wading out there so deep that I'm about to drown. Listen, you can't handle that. 
The Bible's written on a fourth grade level. There's none of this stuff that has to be so deep. We need to hear, go out and touch the world, and we need to actually go do that, and then God will give you some more. But if we're not going to do what we hear, God's not going to give us any more. So watch what he says. He says, if you don't do them, you'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, same storm. The, you know, all the wind blew, the house, you know, the rain, all that. But the house fell and broke apart. And in closing this up, I just want to tell you this. If I'm going to honor God, if you're going to honor God, we're talking about honoring up. God is who we honor first. We honor up. I'm going to honor his word above everything else. And how I honor his word is I do what it says. I mean, is that not the simplest thing you've ever heard? If you're walking out of church today, say, I don't, I don't even know what that guy was talking about. Here's, here's what I'm talking about. I hear God's word in a church when the pastor's preaching and I see it's, it's, it's black and white. It's right there. It's not, it's, the pastor's not making this up. I'm going to do what the Bible says. I'm not going to do what the pastor says. I'm going to do what the Bible says. The Bible said, you know, man, I, I, I'm actually not to forsake the assembling together of those, you know, I'm, I'm actually supposed to be in church. I'm not going to come up with my, old, my own deal. I don't go to church anymore because, 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 because. No, man, I'm going to get around people. People are messed up and messy. You need to just get it in your brain. If I go to a church, there's going to be someone there that's messed up. I might become friends with them and I might be like, oh my gosh, you're messed up. But what if God brought you into their life to help them? Instead of you saying, man, I'm not going to go to church. I don't need church anymore. I've been doing that for years. Instead of doing any of that, man, I'm going to honor God and I'm going to do what he said to do. So in closing, I'm going to ask you this one question today and then I'm going to give you a couple assignment things. I'm going to ask you this question. Every time we walk in, it's different for everybody. Today, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you through what we just talked about? I want you to think about it. I mean, he's got to be saying something to you. There's no way that the Holy Spirit today is silent and he's not saying anything to you. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Is he saying there's some adjustments you need to make? So here's our assignment. I want you to write it down and to be on the screen. Here's our assignment, real simple. Number one, can you think of a way that you are not honoring God that you can change today or this week during the week? What is it that you can change and say, man, I know I'm not honoring God and I need to start honoring him. Next week, we're gonna talk about who the Bible says we're to honor. We're gonna go through several uh, places in scripture where the Bible says you're to honor these people. We'll look at it next week. Number two, um, can you begin to honor God in areas you decided not to honor him in? So maybe you're here and you say, I decided not to honor God in my giving, my praying, my reading, my tithing, whatever it might be. Is there an area like that today that you're like, man, I didn't know it was so important to read the Bible. I'm gonna start honoring God by reading my Bible. I'm going to go home from now on and, and read my Bible on a daily basis. You know, we call here in our church, we do something called soaping. I do it every single day. Um, I would encourage you, if you don't know about it, go to our bookstore and ask them, can you tell me more about what soaping is? And start soaping. It's so simple. But start reading your Bible on a daily basis. Why? Because that Bible is life to you. That Bible's food to you, just like, you know, when we get out of church today, I would imagine almost every one of you, unless you ate before you came, you're going out of here and thinking, where can we go eat? Are we going home to eat? Are we going to a restaurant to eat? Whatever, you're going to go eat something. Can you imagine having this one meal right now and not eating again until next week? Most of you wouldn't do that. So today, we did service a little bit different. I'm going I'm to just ask you to close your eyes in a moment. We did a little bit different today. Pastor Noah is going to come up in a moment and, and receive our offering and do a couple quick announcements. So now we're going to have the challenge of, will we honor the fact that we're doing this this way in our church? Or are we going to get out early and we're going to go get out in that parking lot and get out of here so we can get out before everyone else? Or will we honor what the church does? Because there's part of honor is honoring where you're at in that church, at your job, wherever it might be. Will we honor today and just say, you know what, I can sit for another five minutes and if people get out before me, it's okay. I won't be mad. Yes, all right. So I, that was, you're supposed to say amen at the end of that, but I'll just say it, amen. Um, so I want to encourage you, don't, don't leave right now. Don't, don't leave. Like when I'm here doing this part that I'm about to do, to me, it's the most important time, what we're about to do right now.